thanks, Martin. And uh, I, I kind of feel like I'm in an AA meeting. Uh, I'm Mark Sanders, and I'm an inventor. Um, uh, one thing that I'm passionate about is, uh, mainly because of my own history, combining engineering and design. That, that was my kind of uh, way of getting here. And I think products are a, an absolute combination of the two. And, and they shouldn't be split, these two uh, subjects. Um, now, I'm not going to cover any of the stuff that I did previously at this place about four years ago. So if you follow the screen to the uh, icon just here, or maybe <laughs> here, uh, on the video, you might be able to find the, the previous recording. So, inventor. What do we think of when we say the word inventor? Uh, I like to think of Tony Stark, but other people might think of kind of mad people, but there you go. Um, for me, inventing is all about making products both appealing and also making them work. And I, I tend to make, to be honest, most of my income from products like this, but I tend to love working on products like that, bicycles, which generally don't make much money. Anyway, I think I'm in a fairly unique position to make comments on engineers and designers and how they approach work from different directions. Um, you've probably seen this, this blog. It's absolutely brilliant between uh, Adam and Josh. Uh, but I still think there's a real divide which shouldn't exist between engineers and designers. And I'm hoping... Um, as part of my talk, I can kind of demystify that a little tiny bit. Myth one, um, design is easy and pays. It's just like, you know, you just turn up, do a blog and get loads of money. Engineering is hard and it's boring and, uh, you know, it takes a lot of hard work. Uh, both, both totally wrong. Um, to illustrate this, I want to show a little new product which... Uh, it's come out since the last presentation, so it's not uh, um, old stuff. This is a little can opener, and it's, it, I've done can openers in the past, but what this one tries to do is miniaturize it to absolute, you know, fits in your back pocket kind of thing. And it was a real challenge from both the ergonomic point of view and the shape point of view and the engineering inside. For example, just as you're all CAD people, just getting the surfaces absolutely class A ready for injection moulding was pretty tough. Um, uh, and that was just the outside. The, the biggest challenge was trying to cram this mechanism inside it. And what this actually does from a user point of view is, I mean, users, say like my mum, can maybe only give a few grams of torque. And yet, to open a can, you need something like 60 kilograms of force. So this little fella inside, this is crammed with bits and pieces and stuff like that, um, actually translates those two differing forces. Um, obviously, you have to turn it more than the action, so there's a leverage action. But this gives, gives you an illustration, I think, of the importance of combining engineering with design. One wouldn't work without the other. And, and just to kind of show the journey of this product, um, it, it doesn't kind of just pop out. Um, it was spread between several other projects, but it was about a two-year process from the original sketch of what it might be through multiple prototypes, all being tested, different shapes, things like that, either CNC or rapid prototype, before it ends up in, in, in the shops. Right, let's get back to this uh, myth about um, engineers and designers. Um, the tendency is for engineers to uh, be all about efficiency and saying no to designers. No, that's impossible. And designers tend to be, from an engineering point of view, all dream and style and, and not really much uh, substance. But, in fact, all products are a mixture of these two, on a kind of continuum. And I've just given a few examples here. Um, but the main thing to understand is, is the kind of empathy between the two subjects. And so, um, the advice I would give to engineers is to 
instead of just thinking about what is the most efficient way of making something, also think about what is cool, what is attractive, what is appealing, what would, um, what would my mum like, not just me. And for designers, the equal um, suggestion is uh, don't just assume somebody else is going to do the hard stuff. Get down and dirty. Start prototyping, start doing calculations, start getting involved with that engineering. Because the assumption in the design world is you do a pretty rendering, put it on, on um, one of the uh, websites, and some engineer in a white coat will come out and say, oh, that's good, I'll make it for you. Absolute myth. Anyway, one word which I absolutely love is elegance. Because it has meaning in the design world, the art world, and it also has meaning in the engineering and maths world. It's a kind of a bringing together, empathy type world, word. The other very important factor to bear in mind is uh, the number of engineers in the UK. Um, I think there's a bit of an imbalance between design courses, teaching industrial design, product design, and engineering courses. Um, it, 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 it sort of becomes real when people try and find jobs. And the basic ratio between engineers and designers of, of all disciplines um, is round about 10 to 1. And so, basically, if you want to get work quite easily, you're already skilled in most of the things that engineers do, even if you haven't studied engineering. If you studied uh, CAD, present yourself more as an engineer than a designer. I mean, James Dyson um, basically says we only produce 12,000 engineers a year and there are currently 54,000. And in two years' time, uh, 54,000 vacancies. In two years' time, that will rise to 200,000. So there's the opportunity. Right, next myth that patents protect. Now, this is one that's really, really close to my heart. Um, I'm a bit like one of these um, smokers that's given up and really hates smoking now. I used to really buy into the thing that any idea should be really thoroughly patented. And not just an application, but all the way through to going to the different countries and getting it um, granted. I, I, that was my mantra, that dogma. And... Um, so, you know, I've got loads of patents. Um, but uh, Dragon's Den also <coughs> pump that dogma. They say, OK, what's your IP? Have you got a patent on it? And likewise, the patent office do the same. I mean, if you follow them on Twitter, it's, you know, patent this, patent that. But what is missing in all these discussions is the cost and the cost of patenting is absolutely outrageous. I mean, some, I, I, mean, I was just checking it yesterday, and some patent agents actually say now, we don't deal with SMEs, because patenting is just not for SMEs. It's only for large multinationals. Case in point is, this is one of my products from a few years ago. It's a robotic jar opener. And basically what it does, it simulates what our hands do when opening jars. So when you open a jar, your kind of grip increases whether the jar is slipping or the lid is slipping, and you gradually open it. Now this mechanism kind of duplicates that and works pretty well. Um, the insides, you know, like any engineering stuff, were pretty, pretty complex. And the, the, most, the hardest thing, where I really lost a lot of sleep and blood, sweat and tears, was actually making all this, including the motor, for around about three US dollars, which really sorts the, you know, the sort of real life engineering from, from kind of dreaming engineering. Um, we got a fantastic patent on it. Um, the core mechanism, uh, which is actually an episode for epicyclic gearbox which shares the torque between the top hand and the bottom hand so that it automatically adjusts the torque didn't come up in any of the searches hadn't been done before uh, anyway 
a company in the US, a huge company in the US, um, asked for loads of samples. And bearing in mind the company that made this is a relatively small company, 30 people. Um, and um, they kept asking for samples. And next thing, we got, they got, the company I work for got a letter that said, ah, oh, we've just noticed that we might be using some of your IP. Um, do you want to license it to us? And so the little company said, yeah, sure, you know, let's talk. Then it all went quiet. Completely quiet. Next thing, this appears on the market. And it's an absolute dead ring of copy. Except instead of the automatic one button, it's got two, one to start, one to stop, whereas this does it automatically. And so legal letters go to and from, to and for. And it, I mean, they even copied my mistakes. You know, <laughs> this, was some this was some really, really dodgy FEA. Sorry, Mark. Uh, the, 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 you know, if you did FEA on this again, you'd realise, oops, that, that rib shouldn't have been there. They copied that as well. But this company is a huge, great company. And basically, the bottom line was, OK, sue us. <laughs> and this is what pisses me off about patents. They're only as good as your, the size of your legal team. And the company in America basically had a legal team almost as big as this room. It's a multi-billion pound uh, company. And, and they just wiped, could have wiped the floor with us. Now, that is the thing why patents don't work. They're only as good as um, your bank balance. Now, James Dyson is also of the dogma that patent everything. And he's got a big company, he's not an SME. So he can actually make those patents happen until he comes up against an even bigger company, in this case, Samsung. And this was a small little press release that I just happened to see. And basically, it was Samsung up here, Dyson down here, okay, you win, you've got more money. That is why I believe that uh, patents are a bit of a myth. Just to move it forward, the biggest um, fair in the world is the Canton Fair. This is the Canton Gift Fair, and it happens twice a year in China. And this is the place where all Western buyers go to to pick up next year's products. And a lot of the products they see in there are all counterfeits. I mean, China is a hotbed of counterfeits. And the trouble is, they don't know. The buyers don't know that they're counterfeits. Um, for example, uh, this is my first um, can opener. And um, I just clicked in a search, one touch can opener. And it came up with 536 suppliers of the same thing. Now. Imagine trying to fight that in a foreign country when <laughs> the legal costs are astronomical. It's impossible. You've just got to let go. Likewise, uh, in China, there are 135 people making the, um, the jar opener and 120 pe people, suppliers, making the strider. So I reckon, I mean, that makes the strider probably one of the most made folding bikes in the world. The scary thing is, if you copy a can opener, it's not going to hurt you. But if you copy a bike and make it incorrectly, it probably could hurt people. The good news, well, I'm not sure it's good news, but luckily most of those made, the, the thousands made in China, tend to stay in China. So at least they're near to the factories that made them. So they can take them back and say, hey, this broke. OK, I've been very negative about um, Patents. I just want to give a few hints of, of kind of street fighting through the IP route. I call it pragmatic IP for SMEs. What can we do? Uh, and the first thing is, don't completely um, avoid the patent route. At least put an application in. The first few years of an application are really cheap and simple. And at least you can then say, I've got a patent application in. So for the dragons, when you're in negotiating with your license, you can say, I've got an application in. But that, let them pick up the big expensive tab that comes after about two or three years. Um, 
One of the best ways is to enter your new product um, into competitions and get the PR. Because that nails the product, your name, uh, in time. Okay? And if you get loads of PR and it goes global, um, very few people are going to copy it. Because it's, it's obvious they've copied it from that design competition, that bit of PR. The next thing is to build brand. That's exactly what Brompton do. The Brompton patent, you know the Brompton folding bike? Its patent ran out years ago. But not many people copy it. A, because it's hard to copy. But B, because the customers want to buy into the brand. This made in London thing. The snag with that for people like me is that you've got to devote your whole life to brand building. Um, and if you want to do that, fine. But if you want to move on to something else. Next one is... Get a design registration in the UK and get it converted into the US. Hell of a lot cheaper than US uh, design, uh, a full patent, but it's still called a patent. Number four is get over it. I mean, you've been copied. Okay, in some, think of it as a compliment. Move on to the next thing. Keep ahead of the game because you're not going to change the system. You'll die before you change the system. Um, and finally, go back to those big trade shows. Where do we have it? And um, talk to the show organisers and say, look, this is my IP. That company over there has got a fake copy of my IP. Now, a trade show organiser, by law, um, has, has got to prevent faking. And so he will then go over to Mr. Faker and say, hey, take it off the stand. And if you play your cards right and you invite the press to take pictures and name and shame, that guy will probably never come back again. The other 535 might, but that's another story. Right, okay, that's enough about myths. I now want to get into my favourite subject, which is bicycles. The challenge of bicycles is still fascinating. After, what, 100 years since their invention? And I call them human amplifiers, because, you know, for the same energy as walking, uh, you go four times faster, four times the distance. Take away that energy and, and from humans and give it to batteries and uh, you go even faster still. The, the thing about bicycles is that they offer real freedom. Whereas cars, freedom is a bit of a myth. Especially if you live in cities where 80% of the world's population are going to be in the next few years. I mean, getting from A to B in a city in a car is almost like, you know, you don't know when you're going to arrive. The cycle industry tends to concentrate on enthusiasts rather than non-cyclists. And I call this the, the red ocean, where they're all the, the, the bike industry competing with itself for enthusiasts to buy the latest carbon bike, but ignoring everyday people who probably don't think cycling is a viable option. Um, the, the bikes I do tend to be mostly in this blue ocean, you know, for regular people rather than enthusiasts. Um, things like the Strider, and more recently things like the IF Mode, which um, is a full-size folding bike. And its little brother, the um, IF Move, which is a, a smaller version of that last one. What I'm going to show you now is the development of Mando Footloose, uh, which are these two bikes here. Uh, Mando, who the hell are they? I mean, it sounds like a, an old 10cc track, doesn't it? Mando, fly me. Um, they're actually huge. They're like the Korean equivalent of Bosch. These are just their R&D headquarters. Um, and if you drive any of these cars, you probably re your life relies on their systems working correctly. Um, from driver, they're really big on driver assistance stuff, you know, the stuff that uh, Tesla are also working on, you know, automatic lane changing. But steering, suspension, all that kind of thing is all Mando. Anyway, they have the foresight that big cities are going to get clogged, and Seoul is a big, hilly, clogged city. And so they said, well, how are we going to solve this? And they thought, let's get. Let's look into two wheels. Very bravely, they said, let's apply some of our technology to two wheels. And they patented it. And the basic technology is uh, a kind of 
ECU that controls everything. Um, it's a really complicated electronic system, and uh, I have nothing to do with that. Um, but what it means is that it's effectively an electric um, motorcycle controlled by pedals. Um, and and this, was, this was their approach to turning it into a consumer product. And I got the dream phone call of, hey, Mark, um, I know you're not doing much consultancy at the moment. Would you like to work on this project? Like, mad, yeah, dream project. And so my brief was to try and humanize the technology, to try and make it for everyday humans. And... Um, what inspired me as a folding bike designer was actually nature. Uh, when you think about a bird's wing, it's structural for flying, and yet it's super smooth. And it also folds right up to nothing into its body. Imagine if a folding bike or any folding product was as clever as that. So that was the kind of inspiration. And more than that, um, this bike has a, a huge great joint in the middle which needs, uh, needs to be made. And inspiration for that came from actually a seagull's wing, the, the main joint in its elbow. Let me show you this product. Um, have time. It's basically full of batteries, so it's quite heavy. So you don't actually um, carry it, you roll it. And um, it, it turns into a bicycle by uh, basically pulling out these things and then using a great big automotive lever like that to turn into a bicycle. And um, I'll put the seat up a bit. And the idea is that um, the, the pedals actually control the speed. They're effectively like the throttle. But because it's all ECU controlled, the amount of resistance in the pedals can be completely calibrated to make it feel either like you're climbing up a steep hill or you're just cruising down a hill. Completely up to you. So if you want a serious workout, you can program it for that. If you want a, just an easy ride, you can program it for that as well. And, and the, the instrument read out your speed, the amount of calories you're putting back in the battery system, and, and stuff like that. And, um, and so basically, that's, this was the, the first of their products. I'll just make that stand up. Um, and... Uh, I'll show you how it developed. It, it, I started off, like most things, with a, with a kind of sketch to get the, the basic parameters down, and then rapidly moved into SolidWorks um, and, uh, and, and made some 3D shapes. Um, interesting that uh, the client company used Katia. Uh, both SolidWorks and Katia are by the same company, but they don't talk to each other. And so everything had to be remade in Katia. Um, and I must admit, I do like it here, but it's, it's not for end users. It, it's for full-time operators, if you like. Uh, it's a very complex system, uh, but it does everything and costs a zillion pounds a seat. Um, so I probably couldn't afford it anyway. This is the kind of um, work they did in Katir to, to, to build the product. And as you can see, it's just full of batteries. Um, and in Katir, there's this wonderful feature called Imagine and Shape, which is still part of the history tree, so you can still go back and tweak it and things, uh, but it allows you know, full cloud 3D tweaking, but keeping the A-class surfaces, which are so important. And uh, that was the interesting thing, working with these automotive guys. Um, the most incredible thing for me on this project was the fact that these Koreans worked so damn hard that we went from that, those sketches and their CAD concept from me to full production bike in a year. Now, in my experience, that is amazing. It just wouldn't have happened in the UK. It would have been at least two years. But these guys work almost 24-7. They're incredible. 
a bit of an eye opener that I couldn't keep up with them. Um, and any product like that needs loads and loads of testing. So testing was done Europe and around the place until it, it was safe enough to be let loose on, on the public. Um, okay, that's the product. And um, big automotive features like a, a great big lever to fold and fold it. And of course, roll when fold. That's always been one of my mantras. Um, if, I mean, look at folding luggage. All folding luggage, you pull it behind you. Why not folding bikes as well? It, it's just no-brainer, really. So this also had to be roll when fold. Um, it, it won some awards, which is great for PR. And PR is one way of getting um, a kind of um, IP protection. Um, it, it really is quite useful. But it also said, they also said, right, okay, now we want um, to do the same, but a much lower cost, because it was quite expensive to make this one, like almost the cost of a, a small second-hand car. Uh, we want the same DNA, but uh, we needn't have it fold. So initially starting off with sketches and explaining how it might work. And the basic concept was to make um, a very strong rigid structure in the middle, which is cheap as chips, made in China, but covered in these plastic um, mouldings, which uh, um, basically cover all the, the, the crap. Um, and uh, also means that they're interchangeable, so people can customise their bikes, which is a really big thing in Korea. And so, you know, you get these, these kind of colour schemes and, and stuff like that. Um, so, this has just been launched. And I think, this is, if, I think this is the very first of the new version in the country. Um, I'm pleased to show it here. Um, here's the Photoshop. And uh, I've been Mark Sanders... And that's my old address, 77A. Um, 